with people like Rick Stevens and Thomas Googler. So I'd like to start the evening by doing our welcome to the country. We're, we're meeting across the country in this virtual space and across other countries. Each of us stands in the lands of many different nations. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal as the traditional custodians of the land that I am on and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. So tonight I'd like to welcome, I'm very honored tonight to have Thomas Googler, the president of World Chefs, Rick Stevens, a continental director, and of course, everyone knows Peter Wright, who's now our new continental director of the Pacific Rim. So good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Karen. Thank you Thank for you the you opportunity. Karen, yes, Moss. That's nice. So let me give you a bit of, before we start off, I don't know if everyone's familiar with our, uh, with our guests tonight. I'd like to give a little bit more insight into Thomas, Rick and Peter before we get into some interesting questions and I'm sure some riveting chat tonight. As I've said, Thomas is, Googler is the president of World Chefs. Uh, an outstanding achievement when I look at he's leading millions of members across 110 countries. I find it hard with just one country, but going to 110, you must be a busy man, Thomas. I also, <laughs> yes, I also take my hat off when I see you speak nine different languages. You've won hundreds of medals and awards. You're a member of many chefs associations. And I noticed that you're a German national who's been living in Saudi Arabia for approximately 17 years. And you're working as a corporate director of kitchens for AFS, Naji Group. I hope I pronounced that right. And obviously I've tagged the consultant in food products and W or VVIP catering. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you very, very much. It's a very great pleasure actually seeing all of you online uh, in a different time zone and the uh, most important thing that you are all safe and healthy and all with a big smile because this is what makes the difference as i always say power of the white jacket and chefs behind all of this definitely it's always a pleasure seeing you and uh, hoping that down under is doing better and better like all the rest of the world and we are overcoming this situation a little bit more positive than we actually had in the past months and one and a half years. Is, uh, we're very lucky down here, Thomas. It's been interesting. I'm living in Sydney, so we've opened tentatively for catering, but I can see we've a lot of people online tonight from Melbourne who hopefully are getting out of lockdown tomorrow. And obviously I can see Western Australia, they're, they're isolated in their own little thing, Queensland, Victoria. So we've got members from all across Australia and across the world. So yes, it is a, an interesting time, as I say. No, I, absolutely. I mean, we was very lucky. I just give you a one minute brief. I'm in Saudi Arabia, closed about one and a half years ago entirely. So they didn't leave anyone coming in and out. So we had very low figures in average. We are having now about 30 to 40 people for a big country like this. It's, it's not much, but it was very actually... Yeah, uh, restricted, and even they closed Mecca, Medina, no one could go there. So it was quite a strong decision, but I think it was the right way. I mean, it was in a way like Australia did from the beginning on, and this uh, kept it a little bit more controlled. And uh, yeah, let's hope the best uh, for chefs from all around the world that uh, this uh, situation will be over soon because, I mean, we have to go back to full flesh. Every one of us wants to cook. I mean, not only the lucky ones, also the unlucky ones or unfortunate ones who uh, got laid off. And I think it's time to make the world a better place. I concur completely. And I think, I think the next six months are going to be a very exciting time for hospitality across the world. And obviously to encourage our next generation of young chefs to come true. We also, I suppose we have our Wax Congress next year as well. We've got our ACF one. So there's a lot of exciting things to look forward to. So Absolutely. Hopefully. And I'm, looking, and I'm looking forward to see as many as from 
your region coming to this Congress, it will be something stunning in Abu Dhabi. I can guarantee you that because we are working very, very hard on it, full flesh, maybe to compensate the last Congress, which we couldn't do in uh, St. Petersburg. And additionally, the, the, the semifinals of Worlds, which we also had to cancel. So maybe we compress everything and make it the Hammer Congress for 2022. And we need all of you to be there. <laughs> Well, you won't you won't miss the Aussies when they come in. We're a noisy lot when we turn up, so yeah. that's going to be a big. That's fantastic. <laughs> as you can as you can hear, Peter's jumped in there, so I'll pop over to Peter for a second. Peter, where are you at the moment? Um, I'm in sunny Dubai, enjoying the uh, World Expo at the moment. Oh, you're always off traveling somewhere good, Peter. Wearing the Aussie flag, I can see too, which is always good to see. So Peter, you're you're involved in a lot of big, I say extravaganzas, a lot of games, et cetera. You started off in the Olympics. Was that where you started your whole career from or how you became a chef? Well, no, no. Look, I've been a chef now just on 40 years. So for all the young chefs online, um, when we were teenagers, you either left school and got a job or you stayed on and went to university. So I was fortunate enough to be able to leave school at around 16 years old. And um, the first job I applied for was in a kitchen and got the job and yeah, I haven't looked back since. I mean, I always remember Karen when I was a little kid, I was always hungry. And you know, as you know, I'm tall and skinny and I have a very, very fast metabolism. So there was never enough food to keep me uh, satisfied. And my mother used to bake a lot. So I actually wanted to be a baker and thank God I didn't become a baker because I probably wouldn't have lasted. But um, that was sort of my inspiration. And anyway, my first job, Rick Stevens' father was uh, the head pastry chef. And uh, he used to tell stories about his son, Rick, who used to do culinary Olympics and blah, 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 and do all these exciting things. And it was quite inspirational at the time that there was all these things, you know, I was 16 years old and there was a whole world of um, exciting things that chefs, chefs were doing. And, um, and then years later, obviously I met Rick and uh, he was our team manager when we did the Carmen Olympics. So it was like a full circle um, sort of experience for me. So um, yeah, that's, that was sort of my background of becoming a chef. So then I just look at what Rick is. So Rick, you're a third generation chef and I noticed you're from Tasmania. Is, is, is that Australia? Oh, dear. <laughs> we, should, yeah. we call that the mainland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God. So you started your apprenticeship in, and in Melbourne? Yeah, well, I started in 1972 at uh, Noah's Hotel Melbourne. Uh, that was a new hotel at the time, up in the uh, Exhibition Street there. I forget what it is now. I don't know what it's called now. Um, right, one of the chain hotels. And I was there with uh, Claudio Marcus. And uh, I was fortunate enough that um, the interesting thing for me, when I started back in 72, we was getting about $28 a week. And uh, when I started, like Pete mentioned my father, so he lent me some money to buy my uniforms. And so my mum... We used to pay $15 board and then we'd pay dad back $5 for the uniforms, left me $8. And so then uh, a weekly ticket at the time from Baronia, where I lived, into Melbourne and back, well, I think it was $4.90 a week. So it left me about $3. So for that was it. Um, but uh, I think probably one of the best memories I used to have was uh, when I was apprentice, when I was in my second year, I had the opportunity in the evening uh, on some evenings to, to work what I thought was the best section at the time was the grill. But I only could do it on Wednesday. And that was the day that I went to William Angler's school. And so when school finished at 4.30, I had to be in the kitchen by five. And Claudio is a pretty tough guy. So what he used, so what I used to do to get the tram up was too slow. So I used to sprint up from William Angler's street, uh, from William Angler's all the way down to La Trobe, down the bottom of La Trobe, right up to Exhibition Street. Just to get in, so I was in the kitchen by five, and the perspiration, you know, would be like coming out of here. So 
we had a bit of fun when we started off. It brings back memories, doesn't it? How we all started off. And Thomas, I have to ask you, how did you become a chef? Was it from a young age or was it a family influence? That's a very uh, good question. Actually, uh, since I remember, since I'm about two, two and a half years old, I always wanted to become a chef and I watched actually my grandmother cooking. We have actually no roots in cooking, actually family-wise, despite my grand-grandmother was cooking for the last Kaiser in Austria. So my granny was a really good chef and I decided to become a chef. My parents was behind it and then the story started. So when I made my apprenticeship that time, it was actually the best place in Germany. It was a really fantastic hotel with a super, super chef. But the funny story was I was the only young guy who had no clue about anything. So on my first day, I had something like Rick. I got 50 kgs of onion and cut them into nice, fine brunoise. Of course, the brunoise was a kind of paysan. So after cutting 50 kilo of onions, my boss said, my chef said, all garbage put it into the bin. I said, what? I was crying the whole day. And he said, no, no, we make soup out of it. So that was my start actually. And then I went all around the world. I lived in uh, 13 countries, visited 189 countries in total. And I just can tell to any chef and any young culinarian, go into this field. It's something amazing. It's something fantastic. And I always would become a chef ever again, 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 and again. <laughs> That, and that's what we need to hear at the moment. How about you, Peter? Would you say the same thing? Would you change your career or is this what you were meant to do? Oh, you're on mute, Peter, sorry. No, definitely I would be, I wouldn't do anything else. There's a couple of people I might have shot earlier. Um, okay. And there's probably a couple of things along the way I would have done slightly different, but definitely, I definitely would be would have been a chef. I mean, I've travelled in many countries as well, worked in a lot of different places. Um, you yeah, know, made lots of great friends. Yeah, I can see a lot of names that are popping up watching tonight, and I've worked with a lot of those people. Um, Ernfred Bart, he was my uh, chef de party in the Hilton when I was young, and he was a brutal um, brutal master. But now we're best mates and we have a beer together. So. You know, it's it's great. You can do whatever you like as a chef. You can travel. You don't have to travel. You can work in any field in cooking. You can work in a mobile street kitchen if you want, or a fine dining hotel, or a fish and chip shop, or whatever, whatever you want to do. Or you can just cook for your family if you get bored, you know. So, you know, it's those skills of life, um, I think, are very, very enjoyable. And who doesn't like food? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I never trust uh, never trust a skinny chef, is that what they say, or somebody who doesn't like food at all? Listen, listen, listen there's books written about that. <laughs> and Rick, for you, what do you think to be successful in this career in hospitality? Because you've gone very different ways besides being a chef, you've been a director, etc. What uh, personal attributes do you think a person needs to, you know, be successful? In the beginning, obviously, you got to know the basics from the beginning. You know, you learn the basics, and then you follow it through. But you have to be very open-minded, because uh, the one thing about our profession: no two days are the same, and, and that's what you got to be able to understand. That no two days are going to be the same in our industry, and and, and you need to be able to be, what I said, open-minded. I think you need to be like a sponge, absorb as much information and technology as you can siphon through the bs then come out with something that's going to be good so for example if if you come to my place and i tell you to make profiteroles this way then they go to your place and make profiteroles this way when they go to their own place then they can decide which is the best way but until you tell them it's different they must stay with that on that track so the other big thing is about respect Respect. I mean, and respect is not just for the other chefs, but also for the front of house or anybody involved in our profession, but also respect for the food, understanding the food that you're dealing with, handling, and the respect that the food must have and what you do with it. So these, these are some of the things that you must start with. I agree. 
And Thomas, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Like what attributes you think you need to be successful? Like I'm, I'm very lucky and very honored tonight. I'm sitting here with three fantastic chefs and I'm asking the questions, which is nice. So to you, Thomas. Uh, definitely, uh, what Rick said, I fully agree. The key element of success at the end is your basics. This first years where you are going actually through your apprenticeship makes actually your entire career path paved, I so would say. Definitely, we have a lot of people who came from side businesses, went, to, went into with passion. That's the second option you have. But definitely, you have to have the passion and the talent and the foundation to do it right. And as Rick also said, and I believe fully in that, you have to be actually by heart a good person in order to get the team behind you. A good general without soldiers will never win a war and a good chef without a team will never get the whole menu running in a proper way. So always respect your people from the lowest position up to the top position, take care about them, uh, I had I had 6,000 employees, 6,000 chefs, and I know everyone by name because I think this is really important, a little bit about their family story. They feel a kind of homey, and at the end, they are part of the family. And uh, nevertheless, definitely what I would suggest and what I really believe in, you are never too old to learn. And every day brings new challenges. Uh, take the modern technology, which you have internet or whatever, take the newest trends, work on them, develop yourself further and further. This is what World Chefs did in the COVID times. We did a lot of webinars, try to help people at least in a theoretical way to get further developed. And I think this is the right way. Give your knowledge to the next generations because otherwise it will be vanished. Even you give 100 chefs the same recipe, everything will taste different. So don't worry that they take something off you be a good leader, be an example, and always play fair. Very wise words, I have to say, and very true indeed. I don't know, Peter, if you could add to that, or should I ask you to be, I suppose, to be a good chef or be in this industry, do we need to be enthusiastic? Do we need to be able to try new things? Do we need to be out of the square? What would be your opinion on that? Oh, you're on mute again, Peter. Sorry. One of the greatest chefs I worked with, his name was Domiano, and he'd done breakfast for 35 years. Right? And he could do probably the work of four or five chefs. And he'd come in at three o'clock in the morning and he'd have all his bacon and he'd do the same thing. He cooked bacon, he cooked eggs, you know, whatever, pancakes. And every day he did the same thing. And I used to look at this guy and think, he must be like mentally disabled or, you know, who could do the same thing every day, every day, every day. And then uh, he always had a good suntan, right? And he was always really relaxed. And I said to him, you know, how, how come you're, uh, you're always so relaxed? He goes, I finish work every day at two o'clock. I go and I have my garden. I have my two days off a week and Life's good, and I used to think this guy was crazy. And when I look back, I think he was the smartest one out of all of us because we were all working 16 hours a day, stressed out of our minds, trying to be the grill chef or the sorcier or whatever. And he was this old guy for 35 years just making breakfast, and he was happy. So it's all about happiness, which gets me on to, um, you know, it's 2021, and we've all, we've all got to be politically correct about everything. And... You know, you've got to be paid for every hour. You can't work people too many hours over time and, and all this sort of stuff, which is fair enough. I don't disagree with any of that. But there's this whole me mental um, awareness campaign and, and, you know, people's minds are breaking down and the kitchen seems to be blamed um, for a lot of this sort of stuff. And I always thought you had to be a little bit mental to be a chef to start with. But apparently, it's it's you know if you have, if you have got issues, it's okay to talk about it now. Where when we were younger, you just cry, you know you went home and cried some days, you know, or you went home and drank a, a bottle of alcohol or something so you could go to sleep because you were so stressed. Where now I think we've evolved into a situation where it's a lot more comfortable lifestyle to be a chef. It's a lot more social. You know, you're allowed to have a Saturday night off to go to your sister's wedding and you know you're allowed to have um, you know all, all these sort of things that 
you know, probably Rick and Thomas and I when we were younger and, and Werner, Kim and Jer and others, that, you know, when we were young chefs, you just got brutalised with the, the work, but you stood up to, you stood up for it. And that's why uh, we would survive. So, you know, young people today sort of look at chefs as it's a TV show and it's all about plating up food. You know, oh, I just want to plate up. And young chefs come in the kitchen, they go, oh, I don't want to do the onions. I don't, I don't want to do the fish. I want to plate up food. And then you tell them that maybe in a year's time you can, you can touch some meat or, you know, maybe make a sauce. They don't... Um, they don't really understand. So, you know, there's a bit of a disconnect now with uh, with young people, and um, and what's on what's on really what's on offer. Karen, I would just like to jump in on Peter on top of Peter here, if I could. Uh, when Peter talked about life balance, um, for those who know that when I'm doing sats here, I have 120,000 meals per day. But because I look after all of the sats outlets in Asia. We do 400,000 meals per day before COVID. And one of the things that I think that has put a lot of pressure on us is the internet and the social media. I never, personally, I never answer emails on my phone because we're always stuck on our phone. So most of us, you know, you're, you're still doing 12 hours a day. So if you can't get me in that 12 hours, something's wrong. And the email, I'll answer it in the morning. If something's important, call me. I'm not going to sit there and, and, and answer email after email. And then for myself, I'm just saying for myself, I had a policy. Three emails on the one subject and pick up the phone and call me. Don't copy me in on emails. If you copy me in, I won't answer them because you're not writing to me. And so I think through, through the years, through the social media and the internet, we've put a lot of pressure on ourselves. You know, the bosses will send you a WhatsApp or you're in a WhatsApp group and they'll send it to you and expect you to answer it straight away. I don't do it, guys. So, and, and, this is a, and I think, okay, when I leave work, I've left work. You've got to be, have that downtime to be able to re relax. Exactly what Peter said. You've got to be able to come down a little bit and, and calm down a little bit and relax a little bit. So that, that's why I think we have a lot of trouble in, in, with the social media and the internet with our life balances as a chef. It's very true, isn't it? If you look at people, everyone seems to be glued to their phones, wearing a smart watch. It can become overwhelming at times. Thomas, would you agree with that too? Or what would you see as another big challenge that faces us all as chefs at the moment? I would fully agree on what uh, Rick said. I just can tell you on a funny answer. Don't become a world chef president because you have seven time zones, 24 hours. So that means all by seven. It's crazy. And, and people call you in the night at two o'clock, at four o'clock, at six o'clock, say, are you sleeping? Of course I'm sleeping. <laughs> but in, the, in, a, in another way, it's, it, it's, it's really important, I believe, that you have to actually balance your things. And the most important thing for me personally is to have the satisfaction at my work. If I go happy to work, I can do anything, I can move mountains. And if I go with a kind of a fear, with a kind of an anger or hesitation or dislikeness to work, it will never become a success story at the end. And yes, you have to balance your lifestyle, you have to go out, you have to relax. And you have to also socialize with, with your family and with your friends, because at the end, this is what gives you the energy, which sometimes you need really for this hard job, which we are all in. I don't believe uh, uh, culinary, the culinary field is something easy to go through. I think it is something very demanding, especially if you want to play it on a top scale, you have to be always actually giving 110%. There is no way less than that. And you all know that very well. So I know, and I believe we all went through this, go through this and, uh, in order to have a longer life, yes, relax your body also sometimes because I've seen a lot of fantastic chefs who passed away in young ages, 40, 45, 50, because they took everything um, maybe deeper than in their heart and the pressure was too much. You see this kind of sometimes Michelin star chefs, two stars, three stars, they lose a star, they hang themselves. I don't think this is worth it because you only live once, number one. And secondly, I uh, have to really admit that I think the right way is to balance this in order to at least get 70 and above because 
the first 60 years or 65 years of life you are working i mean not in the baby age of course but it's all the progress to do something and then you are 65 you go for retirement and with 66 you die what you had out of your life i think it's really important that even during these pressurous times when you are working take your relax take a little bit out time and make your life as good as make people happy with your food because when you are relaxed your food will be stunning Thomas, I promise never to call you at 1 a.m. again, okay? <laughs> no, you call me 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Peter, you popped straight up on my screen. I have to ask you, you said you've been in the industry for a number of years. What still drives your passion to be in hospitality and the industry? What is it at the moment? You're, as you said, you're in Dubai, you're doing a huge job. What is it that drives you to do it? Oh, look, I still get a lot of excitement about projects. And um, I mean, you can tell by my career, I've, I've never ever been stuck in one place for very long. And, and that's why I think, I mean, in 2006, I started my own business. And, you know, every year is a different project and they're big ones. So you can work on a project for a year or two years. It's like, I, I guess some chefs like opening hotels. You know, you work on the project and then you do the task and then it's finished. You don't have to keep doing it. You know, it's not so repetitive. And then you can go and do other things. But I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's the fear of failure. I don't know if it's, um, you know, time's running out as you're getting older. You don't want to miss out. The fear of missing out, the FOMO. But I'm always, yeah, I, I can't relax unless I've got you know, something in the headlights. Um, so, I'm, I, yeah, it's a hard question to answer. I've always been that way. And, uh, you know, I think it goes back to when I started my apprenticeship, I wasn't old enough to sign my my apprenticeship uh, contract. My father had to sign. And, you know, back then in the, in the late 70s, your father was like, you know, right, I'm signing this. You have to follow this through. So I've always got that in, my, in the back of my mind as, you know, you've, you've, you've committed to it, commit to it. You know, and, I, and that's another big point. Don't half commit to anything. If you take a job, take the job because it's something you really want to do and you can add the value that the employee or the project requires. Very true. I've kind of gone, mm, what do I say to that? Oh, I've got to twist it up a bit, seeing as we're all chefs here. I'm going to try out a few foodie questions. So, Rick, if you're going out to eat or going out for dinner, what do you go out to? What's your most memorable or what's your favourite type of food or restaurant you go out to? Well, Karen, since I've been in Singapore for the last eight years, I've actually been judging the, the restaurant awards. So... I get to go out to some really good places sometimes. Um, uh, but, uh, and what I'm looking for is, I always look for value for money. You know, as a chef, you have a rough idea how much that costs. You know, if there's 30 people in the kitchen, I don't really care. Um, you know, if there's three people in the kitchen, I don't really care. As long as the food's coming out and, and the quality's there, it doesn't have to be so pretty, as long as it tastes good. Um, obviously, you know, people look at the ambience, but the ambience can be, at a hawker stall, it doesn't have to be some beautiful three-star place or anything like that, but the ambient, but also the company. But probably the best food I, I must say that I had, uh, there's a restaurant in the Napa Valley called Red, R-E-D-D. -E so I went to this restaurant uh, with my wife at the time. Uh, and we, and what happened was um, we, we just took the, the set menu, I think it was eight or nine courses. And then we had matching wines. But the interesting part was the first wine come, the, my wife got a French champagne. Then I got a local bubble. So and then the next, when the first course come, my wife got a scallop dish, which was, uh, let's say, more on the European flavor. And mine was more on the American flavor. And so then each course, the next course, I would get the French wine and the wife would get the local wine. And then, so, we had eight courses, but we really got to test 16, 16 different meals, actually, because she would have completely different. And afterwards, I thought, how fantastic that is. But at the end of the day, it's just menu A and menu B. 
but uh, but the, the concept was fantastic. So so what do I look for when I go out? I, I'm looking for value for money. Um, I'm looking for the food to to be cooked the way you'd like it, but I, I also want the food. I want the main the main part of the food to be the star. I want to, if I'm having a scallop, I want to taste the scallop. I don't want to taste all the spices. Yes, I do want to taste the spices, but I don't want them to kill the, the, the flavor of the food. I, I still want the food, a piece of lamb to taste like a piece of lamb, not full of Moroccan spices, and I can only taste the Moroccan spices. So I still like food to taste the way it should taste. I agree. Now, Rick, if I can jump in on you there. Now, I remember training for competitions and stuff. And I reckon we had dinner at least 75 times. And I, if I look back, I reckon we had Chinese menu A or menu B 72 times out of 75. So that was always the go-to banquet. Chinese, what do you want? Menu A or menu B? That was it. That was <laughs> Not, far but, Not far but wrong. It was all right. But it was all relative to budget. You know, so you know, you're training with a whole lot of chefs. You've only got a certain amount. And you know when you go to these restaurants, you know how much it's going to cost and you know it's going to fill everyone up and you know it's going to be tasty. So, Karen, for me, if I'm just eating, I just want nice value for money food. And if I'm going out for entertainment, spending a lot of money, I want, it, I want the value for money, but I want to be a little bit inspired. And to be honest, a lot of times I go out and I, and I go, what am I paying for here? You know, sixty-eight dollars for a piece of meat, or if I have to order steak off a menu, I'm going. There's nothing else to eat. Like, really, I have to eat steak. So, you know, I think just a bit of inspiration. I like to learn something when I dine in a nice environment. True, sure. but I have to ask Thomas after saying you've been to 189 countries, you travel. What is it for you? Yeah. Now that this is a very good question. I mean, first of all, definitely I agree with what uh, Rick and Peter said. Um, food is a kind of, a, I would say, say nourishment, but I see it sometimes with a little bit uh, different eyes from myself as well. I believe, and what I love to eat is really, I, I love to go to the best places and restaurants around the world, but that's not my key. My key is I wanna have food, something really simple, even it could be on the street or whatever, if it's cooked well. And the best restaurant I ever, ever ate, for sure, was the restaurant of my grandmother. It was cooking at home because this is still in my mindset and my memory, because this is what made me what I am and what, what, how I developed my, my, my culinary, culinary career. But for me, nowadays, it's always like this. In a lot of these fancy places, which they cook geniusly sometimes, but the raw materials are so expensive, it has to be a crossbreed or something. It has to be a, a pink colored pineapple with blue dots inside or whatever. Uh, I believe food for me should be something which I can make at home. Uh, I learned a new word yesterday, uh, <laughs> fridge shopping. <laughs> and they, I saw that in a, in a kind of a program and I said, oh, it's interesting. Out of whatever they have, they make some good food. And this for me is a chef. This for me, you give him something and out of something he has to create something. And I believe this is for me something which is really interesting. Um, definitely, I lived all around the world. I went all around the world. I ate uh, in places which most of the people would not even uh, lift up something from the floor. But I said, look, this kind of tribes, people, they eat this their whole life, so it can't be bad. But generally speaking, I love uh, well-cooked food, something which is tasty, and that's for me the key of everything. It's not only the show. Show we see around the world in nice competition, in the super cool restaurants. But for me personally, maybe sitting on a table, have a nice candle there, a glass of something nice to drink, a little bit of a good cheese and a tomato sometimes. I think this is the break, which we as chefs also sometimes nourish very much if we are coming out of this uh, four, five, six, seven star hotels and of the fine um, dining places that we just actually balance as well. Like our life, having hard work and free time, it's the same with food. I think you have to balance that as well a little bit. But generally saying, yes, I agree with Rick, Amazing food is something which is mind blow and it brings you the direction where we all want to be in a culinary heaven, I would just say. That's very true. 
I'm just going to throw to the three of you then. So we've talked about food, our passions, what we like. So for our next generation of chefs coming up, what would be a piece of advice you'd give to any young chef or young person who's thinking about joining our industry? This is International Chef's Day. It's about being positive. We're all passionate. We're all here for a reason. So I'm just going to throw it to the three guys here to go for it. Okay, I'll go first. Then. <laughs> okay, the way the way that I look at it, Karen, is very is that if you fail the plan, you're planning to fail. So if you don't set some goals, what you want to achieve, how will you hit those targets? And like Peter said before, he, he always wanted to have that project that he wanted to aim for so he could go do that project. And that's what you should be. It, it's setting yourself out like, if, as Peter mentioned, my father was a chef. And he said to me one time, I, he said, if you want to be a hamburger cook, make sure you cook the best bloody hamburger in the world. So if that's all you want to talk about, a little bit like Peter was talking about the breakfast chef. He said, you cook the best hamburger in the world and be proud of what you cook and be proud that you serve it exactly the same every day. So I think it's our own SOPs that we need to set in our mindset. Don't give something the, don't make something that you would not eat yourself or, or don't treat somebody like you don't want to be treated yourself. You know, I think the main thing is that, go back a little bit to what Peter and I talking about before, take the opportunity to rest in, in between work, take the opportunity to take the, the pressure off your mind and the pressure off your family. Um, and the opportunity is there for everyone to reach out. I'm sure if people reach out to other people, they will help with whatever they can. But for the young chefs, walk before you run. Okay, one step at a time and then move on from there. So, Karen, the um, um, Paul Rifkin once, I was at a, a chef's a meeting with a whole lot of club chefs in, in uh, Queensland or New South Wales, I can't remember, and he used to recruit from the local schools. He used to go to the schools and put notices up looking for kitchen hands, and then if there was a couple that showed a little bit of inspiration, he used to offer them um, apprenticeships and things like that. So, you know, the, the the problem is we have was particularly in our region is getting people to actually want to become chefs, you know? So I guess offering some experiences for young people that, because you get into a kitchen and it becomes very exciting very quickly. And so young people are very sort of, they're like sponges as someone said before, and they go, wow, this is so exciting. And then you can grab them and, and, um, and, and steer them along the way. So, you know, my advice to young a young person looking into it would be, you know, just join a kitchen, wash dishes for a company you know, for, for your for your um, pocket money, or you know, knock on the back door of some places. Like you read all all the famous chefs that go to England to work to work and do stages and things like that. They just knock on the back door, or send emails, you know, send CVs out to everyone. And if someone knocked on my door and said, can you give me a chance? I want to be a chef. Oh, may I drag him in? You know, it's, you're in, you're cooking, start, chop, chop. You know, where they turn up now. And, you know, I've you know, put um, advertisements out and five people turn up for interviews and only three of them turn up. You know, they don't turn up. You go, how rude is that? So, you know, that, that sort of dedication and passion uh, that Thomas was talking about, but yeah, for young ones, just get them in and give them the experience. Also from my side, I would say absolutely the same. I give you a very, very short story about one of the guys I selected. Actually, he came to my restaurant when I was uh, living in Germany and he applied for a job and his uh, marks actually in school was very bad. Only F, F, F basically all failed. But I told him, come here, let's, let's make a trial. And he had a fantastic, I would say, talent. And all my people in the kitchen, all my team said, did you lose your mind? I said, no, 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 this guy has a potential. But he's so bad in school, he's lousy. I said, I don't need a professor in school. I need a guy with passion, with dedication, and with a talent. At the end, he became really good. He worked with Anton Mosiman and, and, and. He became a real good chef. 
And he proved that with passion, dedication, and the talent, everything is possible. While his parents never gave him a chance. And this is what I believe uh, in the last uh, nearly 40 years of my experience in the hospitality industry. I don't care very much about the CV. Whenever I got a CV, I have a quick look on it, but everything could be written, especially nowadays with modern technology. You can have, I mean, you could have a, a certificate that you was on the moon, but at the end, that's not the key. The key is people take them in, let them show you what they want to do and select the right people. And I just can have an advice for young people who wants to go into the culinary industry. From the beginning, you have to be really much aware about that it's a really tough job, that you have to dedicate a lot of time, especially when other people go skiing and swimming, you are sitting in a kitchen. So your friends, which you had before, might be at the end, still your friends or might not be, because your time frame goes completely out of the scope. But if you feel to become a chef, go for it. Because as I always tell the young guys, it's an amazing opportunity. It's a fantastic field and you can grow. And finally, you really can theoretically fly to the moon because of your achievements and your, I so would say, experiences you gain through this fantastic field. And uh, work hard for it, go for it, go to places where you have sometimes a hard apprenticeship. Hard means working hard, going into deep to the beginnings from scratch, learning how to cut, how to do, how to make a stock. And then at the end, when you go around the world, you can showcase what you are, be proud, represent your countries, and then become a chef, a hard blood culinarian, and achieve and get your merits all around the globe. And the last advice what I would give them is travel the world, be open-minded, don't think about colors, races, beliefs, and genders. Treat everyone equally. Try to grasp as much as you can from your traveling. Uh, come up with a crossover cooking. Uh, put all these kind of influences in your hands, in your skills. And at the end, create your own way when you are a chef who, who has actually proven himself in the industry about his skills and knowledge. Cool. Well, I think just to add to that, I suppose one thing I've always looked at, I think attitude is the most important thing you can have and respect in a young person or someone coming into a kitchen. I've all, always gone, you can teach skills, you can teach a trade, but if you don't have the right attitude, you may not succeed. And I suppose that's one of the ways I've looked. I don't know if anyone in the panel would agree with that. I think it's being positive, getting in there and being willing is a huge part of being a chef too. Well, yeah, there's no passengers, there's no passengers in the kitchen. And if you're not, um, if you're not inspired to do what you're supposed to do, you, uh, you will struggle a lot. Um, somebody asked me the other day about stress and, you know, and I, I mentioned men mental awareness the other day and, um, and I said, well, I very rarely get stressed. You know, the, these days I'm an older guy. I've got some good experiences. But stress to me is the challenge that you've got a weakness. Not that you're stressing so you have a weakness, but there's something that's causing you stress is because there's something that's, that you're not good at. So that's your weakness. So my, my uh, thought process is always if I'm stressed about something, try to work out what it is and then overcome it. Go through that fear of, you know, I didn't really want to go down that road and then the stress just goes away. So you've got to, you've got to work on your weaknesses more than your strengths and, um, and then you, you almost have, have a stress-free stress -free time. Oh, well, you know, that works for me. We're all nodding with that one. <laughs> You're all... Uh, I have to say, sometimes being in education, Peter, it can be a bit stressful when you've got 16 young people around you. Well, no, I've, I've, I worked one day at William Anglis and um, we were doing a uh, sponsor's masterclass or something or a function. And I think I had 18 students. And after four hours, 
I, I almost wanted to take my own life. It was that, you know, every single question. And there was one guy and he'd been hit by a bus, right? This is a true story. He'd been hit by a bus and he'd lost his mind. But he was a really good chef. And when, when he came out of his coma, he couldn't remember anything. So they were retraining him on how to, you know, how to get his life back. So you'd show him something and all of a sudden this, and he all of a sudden he knew how to make it. And then, and he would have asked me, I, I think, three or four hundred questions. And I went home that night. I was ex absolutely physically and mentally exhausted. And I said, oh, my hat's off to anyone who can do that for a, every day because um, you're right. It's it's mind blowing what you guys do. Very true. And I'm seeing some questions coming in from the audience. And this one's to Rick. Rick, how often do you get back to Australia, especially during COVID? Oh, wow, what a question, guys. Um, I haven't been back for nearly two years. And uh, in that time, I've had two new grandchildren, which I have not seen. So February 4th, I will land in Melbourne. And hopefully I don't have to go into quarantine. Hopefully, at the moment. We're all hoping we can get back to international travel very soon. I'm just yeah. lucky to see actually everyone's very quiet tonight. Has anybody got any questions for our panelists? I think everyone's in awe and just listening to the great advice that you guys are giving out tonight. Come on, don't be shy. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, anyway, great to see everyone. Um, and all the big the big guns are uh, supporting this, <laughs> which is fantastic. So thank you very much. Uh, it's great, I mean, I'm calling in for listening in from Thailand. So same thing. I haven't been there for over two years, but uh, I think Sydney is making opening up. So I'll probably be knocking on the door next month or the months after. So yeah, life's been really tough. Way. It's um, a lot of quarantines. Um, I, I probably have about 20 PCR tests. The nose is already very numb from tests and I'm sure you know that, Thomas. <laughs> I probably had about three months of quarantine the last 18 months. Just come out of quarantine in Bangkok, was in Europe. So, and now I'm uh, just applying for China. So China is the hardest one. Uh, three weeks quarantine in China. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, Werner, I was on the private island of the Crown Prince for two months and every day they do that for you. So basically now they call me horse. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with all your obviously that, and the, but I think we should not be we are, as as some of you guys said, we gotta go with the modern times, and I think you know the wax and you Thomas doing a great job, uh, and 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 uh, Rick uh, as well in 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 Asia. I mean, I can see all I read your communications, and I, I think it's great that you're embracing the the younger generation, which is obviously super important. Uh, it's, you know, it's not, not, you know, it's that they got to go through the same processes. They're not having it easier in a kitchen. It's not easy to, to do what we, you know, what we learned and what we're doing is, but they're using different ways and different methods and, 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 and is that a social media is helping as well. So they, they have other fights, you know, they, they have other mind changes. And I think uh, we got to uh, acknowledge that. And so I think, yeah, I think the, the industry is in the, on the right track. But obviously, yeah, the global, obviously the global, uh, you know, the, the industry obviously changing and uh, might, there might be a gap opening up between the, you know, the industry level and the, 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 the high level, the fine level. But uh, I don't know, that's my thinking. And that's, so just to I touch in on, on Werner there, Werner, you know, one, one of the things like you talk about is the young chefs. I think that's one of probably our greatest accolades is when you, help a young chef or, or your mentor a young chef, and they go on to do great things or even better than what you do. So I think that's when, that's when you feel really proud that you've, you've, had, you've touched them in a certain way, not like Peter would touch them, you've touched them in a certain way, <laughs> and, and then they've, <laughs> and, uh, they've moved on and done something great afterwards. And, and you have, you've been a small part of that growth. Yeah. I've just but obviously, in new levels, you've done a lot. And it's not just, you know, 
you, because being a president and the way you know you support, I think, you know, obviously you, you got a lot of satisfaction out of that way. I think, you know, being active or anyone in this, you know, working for associations or working for, uh, you know, that, that's why we're doing it, isn't it? There's an, a reward there if a national team makes it and, you know, the, the sponsorship money and, and, I mean, you know, all those bits and pieces, you know, they're, 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 they're very rewarding when you look back and say, wow, you know, we, we, we did this or that. And because of that, this, this chef now moved on and, and become a, you know. Yeah. And I'm just looking at some questions that are coming in through the chat as well. I've been asked to ask Thomas, have you any funny stories you'd like to ch share with anyone? A funny story from the kitchen. Sorry, yeah. I. <laughs> I think I think my whole life is quite I think my whole life is quite funny, but um, definitely I mean there are a lot of a lot of uh, I so would say uh, good memories I, I had from all the the times when I was uh, traveling the world. Um, I had uh, once a very very good uh, story. I was uh, working in Turkey and uh, uh, we uh, we was running the biggest computerized wooden yacht in the world. And I was in charge of this, and we was cooking there always for for really top top people, and it was so funny. And they said, oh, "Thomas, you 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 take the yacht, and whenever you need them for your chefs, you can go and you you can enjoy." And it was so funny, you know. So uh, every Tuesday, I I took twenty thirty of my guys, and we went out with the yacht, had some nice cooking. It was quite funny. And one evening, I was sitting in the yacht, and an old man came with this kind of nickel glasses, you know, with a cord trouser, and uh, he wanted to go on the ship. And uh, I said, I'm sorry. Um, it's um, you know, it's it's normally only for for for, for guests or, or or for the team. But the, the owner said you 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 shouldn't actually enter the ship. Uh, and I said, he said, okay, uh, I like that. Uh, you know who I am? I said, no, I'm the owner. <laughs> so <laughs> it was quite funny. And we always used the ship, and it was so nice for the chefs because I believe. If you give chefs a kind of a remuneration, which is not only money driven, motivate them. And this is what I always try to do throughout my career in getting people involved and getting people actually to something like Rick always says, uh, take the guys, lead them par example, develop them very well and also honor them for what they achieved at the end. And I think we all agree on that, that um, we have to really support people. And uh, this is one of the key elements of our success and our good stories from all around the world. Thank you very much. Is there anything Rick, Peter, Thomas would like to add at this point? I think- well, I've, got, I've got a quick funny story. Um, years and years ago when I was president of the Australian Country Federation, we did, and it was one of the first big international chef day um, I don't think we even knew that International Chef Day existed. So we rented a space in the, um, in the gardens next to the art centre in Melbourne, in downtown Melbourne, Friday afternoon. And we put a marquee up and we had barbecues and, and all this. And nobody came. There was like three or four of us. And we put all this stuff out and everybody promised they're going to come and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, my brother's also a chef. And I called him up and I go, why didn't you come? And he goes, what do you think chefs are doing on Friday afternoon? I go, I don't know. He goes, they're all bloody working. Of course nobody's going to come. And I go, oh, my God, of course. Because, you know, I was in a corporate job, so I didn't really, didn't really worry about what everyone else was doing. <laughs> and so I learned a lot from that, though. You know, don't... Um, don't leave any stone unturned, yes. That's very true. Oh. And I have share a good, I, Rick, you first. Okay, I just share one little one little funny story a little bit. I'm sure you all know Michael Schottmanis. So yeah. what, in the 1992 team, Michael was, Michael was my team manager. And uh, I was based in, in Brisbane and, and we're doing a, an event at Leonda down in, down in uh, in South, South uh, Melbourne there. Uh, and anyway, so we call up the guy there and say, do you, do you have a combi oven? And the guy says, yeah, yeah, we have a combi oven. And I go, okay then. And I said, does it, just to be clear, it does steam, it does dry heat, and it does moist heat. He goes, 
No, yeah, we have a we have a combi oven. We we have a steam oven. Yes, yes. Anyway, so we plan the menu. We're doing this menu. We get down there. They have a, a, a convection oven, and then they have a steamer, the old old steamer. So we're trying to cook these di this dish, and we was doing a, at the time we was doing like a buffalo dish. Da da da. Anyway, we knew in the combi oven it took so long to cook. So in the steamer, we had no idea because we weren't using probes and all those type of things then. And so we we sent the food out, and and it kept coming back. People say, "Well done, well done." And well done, like this. They want well done. And Strat Manus walks out. He goes, puts his hands up in the air straight away. He goes, "Thank you, everybody, for saying well done to us." <laughs> so that's what he pushed it across. To first time we've ever got an accolade before you finish your meal. Thank you. <laughs> that's a good one, Rick. But I also have a good one. It's quite interesting. Uh, when I was in the with the German national team, when we was actually going to the big events, one of our mission was to go to the Expo in Luxembourg. So, Vartel Club, Culinary World Cup, Luxembourg. Every young chef, it's a dream going there, like to the ICA and participating. So, we were cooking, we were training for weeks and months. And on the day, we were loading the truck, the second truck. We went into the truck and we started off. So, we was going some hours. And of course, the whole team was sleeping because the drivers was doing fine. And then we opened our eyes and we saw French written signboards. And it was written Strasbourg. So the guys, the drivers went some hundred kilometers in the wrong direction. <laughs> Instead of going to Luxembourg, they went to Strasbourg. <laughs> so, <laughs> So imagine you have the whole trucks full of the food for the World Cup and you're ending up in France. So I said, wow, that's a problem. <laughs> and at that time, the, 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 the borders were still closed. So you just couldn't go with a truck full of food, passing the border and go through France and going up. So we reached Luxembourg 10 minutes for clo before closing time of the expos. It was really crazy. I tell you an experience I never forget. <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've got a cheeky one here from Patrick O'Brien for Rick. <laughs> I'm getting the private messages too. Rick, I've been asked, how do chefs use baby bottles? <laughs> okay, guys, Th this one here. Everybody knows Brendan Hill. So Brendan, myself, and Glenn used to go to Perth a lot to, to judge the competitions over there. Anyway, so we're there. We in the, They used to have three kitchens set up. And so I was in, let's say I was in the middle kitchen judging, having a look, and Brendan was down the other kitchen having a look around. And this lady had come up to me and said, oh, chef, can you heat up the bottle for me? And being a father, I knew exactly what to do. I went and put a pot of water on, dropped the bottle in there, heated it up. And Hilly's looking at me from the other end. He's pointing at me at bottles and that. And I go, what's Hilly on about? So I get, I get excited. I say, Hilly, come over, come over. And he comes over. I said, look at this, mate. Look at this. They're making glaze straight in the bottle and they're going to squirt it onto the plates. And Hilly thought, this was absolutely amazing. But then I just took the bottle, did a little heat test on my hand and passed it to the lady. And Hilly was just standing there with his face wide open. Oh, God. <laughs> There's always one. Well, gentlemen, I would like to say thank you all. I really appreciate your time tonight. I know you're all busy. I would like to acknowledge everyone who's online tonight and wish everybody a happy International Chefs Day. We're all working, we're all out in industry. When you look at any other celebrations around the world, such as Mother's Day, et cetera, that's a day you lie in, you get looked after. But us as chefs, we're a service industry and we're the ones that always look after everyone else. So I would truly like to say happy, happy um, Chef's Day to everybody. Take care. I hope the next period of time is successful for everybody. And I truly look forward to meeting you all in person at an event in the very near future. But I'd also like to just give one huge thank you to Vanessa Barnes, who's our, um, 
our ICD ambassador for Australia, who's done a lot of work with me behind the scenes to get this done. So thank you. So thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rick. I really appreciate your time. And everybody online is saying the same thing. So thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you very thank much. You Thanks, so much. Thank you. Yeah. Please all stay safe, healthy. Stay exactly. Thank you.